throughout this whole book, he literally only ever writes about women as commodities who are there to boost his ego or make him look cool or for him to have sex with. Pablo Picasso. How does he talk about women and his relationships to women? Bill Clinton. Napoleon Bonaparte. And the man who started it all for the modern Western world, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, were raised to believe that great men should have great desires and one terrible weakness. It's so easy for someone like Jake to be like, yeah, I just worked for it. You know, you can do anything if you try and stuff like that when he comes from a place of such like privilege and money and he had his entire family supporting him and he had all these opportunities kind of handed to him. And like, I mean, even stuff like having a video camera at his age, huge privilege. Oh, your privilege is showing. Maybe this is just because I'm not a fan of Jake Paul. He never talks about any real deep or meaningful relationships. He never really talks about anything deeper than Carl's Money Girl. Right on the first page, Jake tells us, You'll never see me at the club. You'll never see me at the late nice night house party. You'll never see me drinking. You'll never see me smoking. I'm all about that strong work ethic and striving to achieve my goals, all while having fun, of course. And rereading those bits made me realise just how awful some of the parts are where he talks about women. He's just, he's very objectifying. He, he, he minimises everything a person is down to their looks. And it's lots of kind of like little things that just don't portray women in a good light. You have to remember that he is a 19 year old man, an adult at this point, telling single girls to DM him. Lists in which he describes every girl he's ever been intimate with and how. He has like instructions for kissing. He talks about how hot these 14 year old girls he knew were. And it's just very odd in the context of who's writing it and who's reading it. There's at least a good moral to some of the stories being told. Like there's definitely good little teachings in here for the young people reading it, like messages about working hard and not giving up and apologizing when you do stuff wrong. But on the whole, most of them just revolve around, and then I got girls and money. Next, let me tell you about girls and money and designer clothes. Next, let me name drop. Oh, and by the way, girls, 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 money and girls. That's like, 75% of the book and it's not interesting. There's a huge issue with how he talks about women and girls. It's incredibly objectifying throughout the whole book. There's some very jarring passages. It's very odd because you see him at 19 kind of like stepping into adulthood and starting to try and navigate adult relationships and living by himself, managing money, having an actual job and responsibilities. And you see him kind of starting to try and navigate this stuff. But all while having the mindset of a child. I'm only four years older, but the way he just objectifies women and just talks about basically using them for sex. Like I'm all for alternate lifestyles and letting people live however they want and all that kind of thing, but I will never support glamorizing immaturity. That's that's what it all boils down to. This book was published by Simon & Schuster. Clearly, Simon & Schuster, with these YouTuber books, are just trying to make a quick bit of money off influencers and their large audience, and don't actually care about the books they're putting out. It's clear that they just say to this YouTuber, we'll give you X amount of money for 200 pages, write whatever you want, and then these YouTubers fill the pages with whatever crap they want. Actual people who care about books and writing, people who actually care about their work and work for years, decades to hone their craft are just ignored and never actually get published when they deserve it far more than this crap. He literally includes a whole page in the book saying, girls, 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 over and over. I can see why he got a book deal. And then he goes through and lists each young girl he was intimate with and lists them by name and tells his child fans everything that happened between them and how he ended up cheating on three women at once. Lovely. There was a men's room, a ladies room and a room marked family. We stood out front for a moment and then without ever discussing it, we walked together into the shared family bathroom. The door shut and we stood directly opposite each other. Then we made out. He then goes on immediately to talk about Michelle. She was blonde and had an athletic body. Exactly my type. Are you seeing a pattern here? She just looked sexy. She was the first girl who made me stop everything and go wow. So did Julie. Who's Julie? 
Julie. She was a brunette and had an athletic body. Exactly my type. She also had boobs. I was into making out, but I'd heard that others were doing more than kissing, including Julie. It's so disgustingly objectifying. Julie and I went into my room together and made out. Then after a while, her hands went places and so did mine. And suddenly we were past making out in brand new territory. At least for me, I was like, oh my God, this is the best moment ever. The cool thing is that that moment is still pretty great all these years later. This is so gross for an adult to be writing this for children. And I mean, yeah, teach kids about sex education, teach them in an educational manner, teach them about consent and what's appropriate and respecting your partner and all that other stuff. Educate them, speak to them about it, normalize it, destigmatize it, but... And it gets worse in the next, next chapter, which is titled 10 facts about teenage guys that every teenage girl should know. While girls are occupied with their hairstyles, clothes and shoes, and maybe cool rings and necklaces, most guys in the 8th grade are thinking about what girls look like after all that's removed, and they're in their underwear or bathing suits. If you need a translation. I see all women in my life as objects and only think about how I can use them for sex. I assume all men are also like me. I mean, yes, Jake, it really sounds like you liked Julie for who she was and just being herself and not because, in your words, she had boobs and you'd heard she'd done more than kissing. Kelly was tall and blonde and beautiful. There was nothing unawesome about her or about the idea of hanging out with her for the four days of the tour. I found pictures of her on the internet, not a difficult thing to do. I hadn't been able to stop thinking about her. She was the hottest girl I'd ever seen and she was famous verified on Twitter. He doesn't even say anything about her other than she's tall, she's blonde, she's beautiful. She's verified on Twitter. That's a personality trait, apparently. Then again, she wasn't just any ordinary girl. Not with that long blonde hair, sculptured features, and sparkle in her eye. So once again, I should mention, we're now three chapters in that she's been mentioned and spoken about, and I know nothing about her personality, her interests, her character. Apparently, blonde and hot is all we need to know. We've gotten to the point where nobody thinks it's morally acceptable to ridicule someone for being homosexual. It's not appropriate to ridicule someone for being transgender. Because even if that sexuality is a type of sexuality you would not enjoy yourself, that you would not choose yourself, if you had a choice, that's the only sexuality they've got. That's who they really are. That's what they have to work with. That's their struggle in life, right? They live with those desires and they can try to silence them and they can try to suffocate them, but that is a part of who they are. So we've developed this philosophical attitude that we all ought to live in a society together with some degree of tolerance and even admiration for the transgender people and the intersex people and the bisexual people, all kinds of people with, you know, minority sexual orientations, that we ought to admire them and appreciate them if they have the honesty to come out and talk through exactly the kind of thing Jake Paul just talked through in this autobiography. And yes, we all find it embarrassing. We all find it hard to listen to. Okay? Hearing a 19-year-old discuss his sexual development between like 16, 17, 18, 19, right? It's hard to listen to. I don't want to hear it. I don't sympathize, right? But I think we should pay really close attention to this double standard. It's a little too easy to laugh and sneer at Jake Paul between the ages of 16 and 19 because these are his desires and this is his sexuality. That's the only sexuality he's got. Think about it. Think about what you're asking of him. Are you asking of him to be an angel rather than a human being? Are you asking him to have the maturity of a 35-year-old man rather than a 16-year-old, 17-year-old, 18-year-old? You have to make a decision. 
Are you going to engage in politics by addressing your thoughts to human nature as it truly is or as it ought to be? Because the vast majority of men of all ages have a lot more in common with Jake Paul than they have in common with me. And you know what? The vast majority of men of all ages would prefer to live their life like Jake Paul than to live their life like me at any age. You know what? For me, it's not just in my 30s. I'm 42 now. Already, when I was 16, 17, 18, 19, already, I was really hung up on this idea that you should not choose a woman and you should not fall in love with a woman because of her physical appearance. I can't even say because of her physical appearance alone. I felt that a woman's physical appearance ought to be a relatively minor and trivial thing compared to who she was intellectually, emotionally, ethically. And you know what? I still feel that way to this day. And it's just not the case that I'm right and Jake Paul is wrong. All right? You can laugh, you can sneer, you can point your finger at his sexuality, but that is the only sexuality he's got. You can say to him that he ought to care about the quality of someone's character, and he ought to seek out women who will appreciate him for his, for his character, right, at age 19, at age 16, whatever character he would one day develop. Do you think he already had it at 16? Do you think he already had it? And the women he was getting involved with who were variously fashion models, Instagram models, one of them was a comedian, I think, and so on and so forth. The other teenage starlets going to auditions in Hollywood he was meeting who were probably sharing his same level of shallowness and were probably attracted to him for reasons just as shallow as why he was attracted to them. Are we going to address our philosophies to people as they truly are, or to a notion we've made up in our own heads of what they ought to be, an ideal they're supposed to live up to. If you have a gay cousin or a gay brother or a gay uncle, there is no sense whatsoever in reproaching them and saying, well, you ought to live as I live and you ought to feel as I feel and you ought to desire what I desire in life, right? And there's actually a profound sense in which, no matter how polite you are in saying that, you are guilty of a kind of bigotry. And if you haven't already been thinking about it for decades, it's a little bit difficult to, to wrap your head around that, right? That sexuality is the only sexuality you've got. Those are the desires they are going to live with their whole lives long. But I'll tell you this, whether you are deep or shallow, whether you are gay or straight, whether you care primarily or only about a woman's appearance or about who she is ethically, intellectually, emotionally, otherwise, your desires should not define who you are. You should not think of yourself, first and foremost, as gay or straight or bisexual or transsexual. You shouldn't let this become a mask that you wear that covers up your real face. You should live a life that's meaningful in so many ways that what you desire and even who you fall in love with or and who you pursue and the people who break your heart, that all that stuff, that whole realm of human sexuality, that it's a relatively small part of your life. That's a relatively small part of what's meaningful to you. So that if you do sit down to write your autobiography one day, like Jake Paul, it isn't the dominant leitmotif of what you have to say about your life. Where when a publishing company hands you a blank sheet of paper and says, tell me about yourself, where all you've got to say is, these are the women I chased. These are the women I slept with. These were the desires that defined my life. And I lived according to their dictates. But in the case of Jake Paul, let's not compare him to some angel that we imagine he could be. All right, this is who he is. This is all he's got to give. This is his story to tell. And if this were the autobiography of a transgender person who would become a prostitute, there is no chance Rachel Oates would be passing these kinds of judgments on the person ethically. None.
It's exclusively mainstream heterosexuality that is in this way singled out, vilified, and punished as if it's an illness, as if it's a contagion, as if it's something to be apologized for, that he ought to be ashamed of himself, that he likes tall, blonde, athletic women. You, you would never say that about a gay man who said something similar about the men he pursues, or a transgender person, or a bisexual woman, or a prostitute writing her autobiography about her years as a sex worker. Never. So there is a double standard here that matters. A little bit deeper. I think all of us, even somebody with as little book learning as Jake Paul, all of us are living our lives in the shadow of the culture, not just of what it means to be a man, but of what it means to be a great man. Pablo Picasso, Donald Trump, Bill Clinton, Napoleon Bonaparte, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, men who describe themselves and define themselves in terms of these overwhelming desires, and men who shamelessly or even pridefully talked about themselves in terms of their weakness, their inability to resist the temptation of the, their desire for sexual relations with innumerable attractive women, all right? Jean-Jacques Rousseau really created this pattern, and one of the reasons it was so influential was that Rousseau directly influenced Napoleon Bonaparte, and Napoleon Bonaparte went on to influence everyone on planet Earth, including Pablo Picasso and Jake Paul. I kid you not, all right? This idea that a great man isn't someone who has the self-discipline to sneer at his own desires. That a great man isn't someone who can rebuff the advances of a beautiful woman as something trivial compared to precisely the greatness of his ambitions or all the other things that make his life meaningful. No, no, no. What emerges in the writing of Jean-Jacques Rousseau is very specifically the idea that the great man from his early childhood forward has these intense sexual desires and he writes them all down in his autobiography and they shape and reshape his life. Okay, Jean-Jacques Rousseau changed his life forever by converting from Protestantism to Catholicism because he had a crush on a pretty girl. He ended up having a three-way with her. He ended up having kinky sex with her and her manservant, as I recall. It's a very strange situation. This is one of the most formative sexual experiences of his life. He went on to write about it at great length. Napoleon Bonaparte lost his virginity sleeping with a prostitute. How do we know that? Because he wrote about it himself, right? The confessions of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the idea of the great writer, the great artist, and the great political leader, that this is a man with great desires, with overwhelming desires. And he goes on to become famous, irony of ironies, for writing, of course, his philosophy of education philosophy of parenting and raising children. Jean-Jacques Rousseau got the same woman pregnant four or five times. We don't know. We don't know if it's four or it's five. Because every single time he had her take the baby and hand it over to a group of nuns, he had the baby handed over to an institution where maybe it was given up for adoption and maybe was educated and raised entirely by nuns and priests. We don't know. There were no records kept. He was never able at a later time to track down any of his own children. This man is everywhere considered a good man and a great man and a genius. And he is especially admired for his philosophy of parenting and early childhood education. Um, we're in a very difficult period of transition. Not just from Christianity to atheism, but from a long history of not really questioning for centuries what it means to be a great man, what it means to be a man, what it means to be great. And now, in the absence of God, 
simply what it means to be good. My slang is editorial, explicit material, briefcase show, live and stereo flow, feel me.